back, faithful politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I am joined with your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going? Doing well. Well, thanks. And this week we have with us Tim Alberta. He's a staff writer for The Atlantic, the former chief political correspondent for Political, and has written for dozens of other publications like The Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, and Vanity Fair. But this week we are talking with him about a new book that he's got out called The Kingdom, The Power, and the Glory, American Evangelicals in an Age of Extremism. So welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure, and 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 I I have to say just at the top, I am a I'm a big fan of your work. I uh, I've been um, a uh, regular reader of all the things you've written, and especially the things that you write about in the in the faith and politics space. So I'm just I'm just so happy that you can be here to kind of chat with us for a little bit. But um, I do want to get into you know kind of your your journey um, to you know, write this book. I mean, the, the, the book is just phenomenal. I mean, it really is. It's like with every, everything from like the pro, I mean, the prologue actually got me, got me hooked, um, which, which is sort of a weird thing uh, when I read yeah, a lot of really good. Um, So, so maybe you can share with us kind of your, your personal journey um, on how you got to a place where you wanted to write a book, um, the kingdom, the power and the glory. Yeah, well, you know, I, I didn't plan on writing this book, and um, in many ways, I don't think I ever would have been comfortable trying to take on a project like this uh, otherwise. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, and uh, I was born and raised uh, in an evangelical family. Uh, my dad was an evangelical pastor. My mom was on staff at the church. All of our friends, our family, our whole community was, you know, built around the evangelical church. And, you know, I, I think like many people my age uh, who were raised in that environment, as you get older, you start to question certain things. You grow skeptical about certain things, um, kind of relating to the institution more than anything else. Um, didn't really ever affect my faith, but uh, certainly you start to, you know, look at certain people, look at certain issues differently. And all of that said, I, I still never would have thought to sort of step out and, and write any of this uh, the way that I have, uh, were it not for kind of a personal tragedy in my life, which was um, actually right after I had published my first book, which was about kind of the collapse of the post George W. Bush Republican Party and then Donald Trump's takeover of the Republican Party. Uh, right as that book published, my dad very suddenly died. And um, the last time I saw so him. Sorry. It, yeah, it was it was just it was a it was one of these crazy things that can happen in life where like the highest high is suddenly intercepts with the lowest low and leaves you just reeling. And in fact, the last time I saw my dad was when he'd come out to Washington, D.C. for the book launch. He and my mom drove out from our home in Michigan, and um, we had a great time together. But it was interesting because all the way leading up to the book launch and then even there at this Washington book party surrounded by all these like VIPs, my dad is like needling me and saying, hey, like, don't waste your whole life writing about these people. Don't waste your whole life writing about politics. <laughs> like, you know, there's so, there are so many more, there are so many stories out there for you and God's given you these incredible talents and, and, and don't waste them, you know, on, um, think about what's eternally significant. Right. And that was, you know, always his message for me. Well, so then fast forward, uh, sorry if I give you the long version here, but the short, the short story is that when he dies suddenly right after that, I met, uh, our home church in Michigan for the funeral uh, activities. And uh, because my book had been in the news, uh, you know, Trump was tweeting about it and Rush Limbaugh was kind of lighting me up on his show a little bit and things were interesting for me at that time. I had people in our home congregation at the funeral and at the viewing kind of confronting me about politics, um, wanting to litigate, you know, what I'd written in my book. Um, wanting to argue about Trump. I mean, my dad's in a box like a hundred feet away and there are people who are like wanting to argue about Trump. That's crazy. I mean, it, yeah, it was. And there's like, I think we all have had these moments maybe where something that had been sort of abstract becomes very concrete. And, and for me, I, I had a sense because of the work I do, because of the faith community that I'm in, 
that something was a little off off its axis, uh, I suppose, in sort of the evangelical world. But that was really just the moment where it just kind of like a two by four over the head. You know, I just like there was no avoiding it. Right. And and mm. as I thought and and re really reflected and, and prayed about all of this, um, I just really felt this nudge and the nudge sort of almost became a, a shove that like this was this was something that i was uniquely positioned to do that i felt could hopefully help the church um i know that there are going to be some people uh, and there have been some people already when they've heard about this project who i think are really anxious about it really you know worried that i'm coming to sort of uh, burn down the church in fact it's just the opposite um i really felt that there was a moment here to press pause and try to facilitate a dialogue about what's gone wrong, but also what is still right and, and, and how we try to get this thing back on, on track. I love that. I think that's so cool. I love the story uh, at the beginning of the book where you talk about in the prologue, this experience that you've just relayed to us and almost relived in a sense. So thank you for doing that. I'm sure is a very difficult experience. I mean, I know you wrote about it and everything, but I'm sure you wrote about it out of that difficulty and sitting there like, if they're willing to come up to me at this man's funeral that they so deeply respected and loved, and instead of showing respect, arguing with the son about politics, then what is going on? What kind of hold does politics have on the people of the church? And the more that I think about this, the more that I'm interviewing people that write these amazing books, the more I read books like yours, I just get very, very, very concerned. I have the, I want to stick my head in the sand kind of, you know, the ostrich complex. That's what I, that's what I prefer to do, but I don't think we can stick our head in the sand anymore. Like the, it feels like the my church that I grew up in and love so dearly is just careening towards a, a, a right, a, uh, like a, a Canyon and she could fly off this cliff because they don't, or at least a certain section of it, because they're basically deifying Trump to the extent that you can deify someone in America. I mean, to say that someone is God's instrument is basically the closest we can get to deification in America. This isn't North Korea, you know, we're not, we're, it, it's, it's not a giant cult yet. <laughs> I hope it never, ever becomes that. But I got to take a step back and you can, you can, and, and Tim, I got to say, I, I, I resonated so much with your book, with your thought process, with the just feeling like things are so off, like what is going on? Almost feeling like it, it, there's so many things that are about us so much. I can't recommend it highly enough. And I'm excited we get to talk about it. And I want people to, to buy it and read it. But I want to take a step back and ask a process question. Because I, I'm, in a, I'm in a doctoral program for a doctorate of ministry. And I love like ancient history and stuff like that because I'm a Bible guy and I love looking at all that stuff. And so I'm kind of getting a sense of how do you figure out things from ancient history, right? You have the primary sources, all that. But not looking at data now, like they had to be selective every time they chose what they're doing, like when they're writing ancient history. And they had access to a fraction of the information we have access to. And how was it trying to wade through the bewildering amount of information that you had to go through? And then talk about the selection process. How did you say, yeah, I want to put this story in. Yeah, I want to do this. Oh, yeah, this one's good, but it's not quite good enough. Uh, you know, real, t real estate's expensive in the book. So we got to figure that out. How, how did you go through that? Man, that's a really interesting question. You know, what I set out to do first and foremost was really just learn. I wanted to go places I hadn't been. I wanted to spend time around different sorts of people, different settings, different church sizes, different church traditions. I mean, again, we're not, and I make this clear at the, at the outset of the book, 
we're not casting a net all the way across Christianity here. In other words, this is not a book that's meant to uh, sort of examine the historic black church or the progressive church or, or the mainline Protestant tradition or the Catholic. I mean, this is really a book aimed at the conservative evangelical church in America. Now, you're always going to have some sort of definitional overlap and some, you know, Venn diagramming happening. But basically, within that tradition, within the, the conservative evangelical tradition of today, there is such a massive spectrum to explore that even within within that sort of narrower confine, I really wanted to make sure that I could uh, safely say that I had gotten kind of from one pole to the other, that I had explored the entire thing so that I wasn't caricaturing, so that I wasn't um, kind of giving disproportionate emphasis to, to certain things culturally or, or theologically or politically or otherwise. Um, so I really spent like three, three and a half years on the road. I mean, I, I, I was just, uh, wow, that's guys, remarkable. Yeah. As you guys see, like in the book, I mean, I basically every corner of the country, um, I mean, I was, I, I actually did lose count at one point of the churches, but I mean, I was at well over a hundred churches, but then all kinds of like kind of just ministries, nonprofits, college settings, Christian schools, you know, you name it. Right. And then I think the the culling process for me was about, I was about halfway through that reporting journey when I started to think very concretely about, okay, how do I organize this into something that makes sense, right? And I had always, since I was a little kid, like I've always been fascinated by the Lord's Prayer. Um, we were looking for, it's just a funny aside, my mom and I were looking for, uh, through some like old photo bins and like childhood things in, in my parents' basement. Uh, not long ago. And I actually found this picture I'd drawn of my dad. I must have been in the pews as like a seven-year-old on a Sunday morning. And I drew a picture of my dad preaching and then wrote the Lord's Prayer underneath it and underlined the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So I, I started thinking about that phrase, the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And, and it really started to click that, okay, maybe this is particularly with the emphasis in the first part of the book on America as a sort of counterfeit kingdom, um, and as in some ways almost a competing kingdom uh, for too many Christians. And that's when things started to fall into place. So process-wise, once I really had that thematic cornerstone in place, then I could start to sort through these different reporting uh, trips I'd been on, the different interviews, the scenes, the characters, and, and try to figure out, okay, how do these puzzle pieces fit? And... Um, and then once I was, then once a couple, you get the big corner pieces into place and suddenly it starts to make a lot more sense. But there were a couple of years there where it was just like, you know, spaghetti at the wall and you're just like, you're just, you're just seeing what's <laughs> like, Am there. I ever going to get this thing written? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so funny. You, you know, I was, I was going to ask you about the title of the book because, uh, you know, we, we speak to a lot of authors here and I'm always curious, like, did you choose the name of the book um, or did your publisher? So I, I'm curious because it's because the kingdom of the power of glory actually has some uh, significance for you. Like, did, did you choose that that name? I did. Yeah. Chose the name and chose the subtitle, um, uh, which is American Evangelicals in an Age of Extremism. And yeah, I, it was it was interesting because, you know, I'm writing for a secular publisher, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, th this, yeah. book, this book is published by HarperCollins. Um, it's edited by a non-Christian. Um, I, I think uh, it was important to me to get feedback along the way. I've got a very close friend of mine uh, who's a believer who I was shipping off chapters to to get his feedback. And then I ultimately uh, asked my pastor to, to read it. Um, mm -hmm. when, the, when the manuscript was done and he gave me some really good feedback, I told him, I said, look, man, I've got fact checkers. I've got copy <laughs> editors, but I don't have like a theological backstop here. Yeah. So like if I get, if I've gotten something dead wrong theologically, I don't want to look like a fool. So, so he saved me from uh, some embarrassment there. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of an interesting process just in that sense of writing a, an unapologetically Christian book for a secular publisher. Um, there's a bit of a needle threading there, but they've been great. And I think, uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to introduce it to uh, a, a bigger market than would typically be receiving uh, this sort of book. Yeah, you know, one thing I, excuse me, I think I really 
appreciate about you writing this book specifically is that we've spoken to a number of people that have written phenomenal books. I mean, um, uh, Andrew Whitehead wrote a book, um, uh, kind of almost similar, uh, American idolatry, which is really good. Um, he's a sociologist professor. We've spoken to like Robert Jones, um, from PRI That's great. and, and, uh, and a number of other authors that write about stuff in this space. You are probably the first, um, journalist, um, that, that has written, um, a book of this magnitude. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about the reach of this book. Um, but because, because of sort of your, your professional background, I think that you have an insight about the American state of mind, especially in this space. Um, like you, you have an understanding that most people don't have. Um, and I, I would be interested to hear how you think that, you know, the, the, the relationship between evangelicals, uh, evangelical Christians and their pursuit of power has changed, you know, since, since you kind of started this, this journey. I mean, you know, there's like the religious right, you know, many, many decades ago, and that was sort of like one data point, but, but a lot has sort of happened in between. So I'd love to kind of get your, get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Wow. It's a big, it's a big uh, subject to tackle. I think the thing that I would emphasize and this really became clear to me in my own reporting. Um, one of the big differences between the rise of the religious right, you know, talking, you know, mid to late 1970s, Jerry Falwell, moral majority, the whole deal, relative, you know, to 50 years later where we are now, there are some similarities, obviously, uh, in terms of how they talk about things. Actually, there are some really striking similarities in how they talk about, you know, public education, how they talk about uh, the, this kind of secularizing society, how they talk about government coming after religion, things like that. What's what's really striking as a difference when you think about those similarities? I think the big difference is that you know, fifty years ago. Most of the people involved in that movement who were really like um, who were really sowing a, a a deep fear in the minds of Christians in this country, they didn't really believe what they were selling, right? In other words, they were they were saying that the apocalypse is nigh, that um, you know, beware, this country is about to collapse. The secular humanist progressives are gonna are, are gonna take us over, and they're gonna banish the Almighty from public life, and you and you and your family and your church aren't safe. They said those things to gain influence, to gain political power, to raise a lot of money, to build a bigger and bigger platform. But most of them didn't actually believe their own rhetoric. I mean, we know that from uh, from. Uh, contemporaneous statements. We know it from interviews after the fact. We know it from memoirs that have been written. Uh, I I've talked with people who were involved in that movement who, you know, it was all just sort of a, it was a bit of a ruse, right? If you fast forward 50 years, I do think that today, a lot of folks really do believe it. And, and that helps to explain the Trump phenomenon in a way, because, um, this talk of, you know, the barbarians are at the gates and America is on its last legs and desperate times call for desperate measures and the ends justify the means. Well, suddenly, if that's the way you're thinking, then it starts to make sense how someone like Donald Trump could become the champion of this movement that he has nothing in common with. I mean, in fact, I have, you know, I quote people in the book, Mike Huckabee and Robert Jeffress and others who talk about how the reason that Trump became their champion was because he didn't play by their rules. He didn't read their sacred texts. He he wasn't restrained by their same, you know, kind of um, religious strictures, if you will. And, and that freed him to to fight for their community, their under siege community, as they would describe it, in ways that nobody else could. And to me, that is like the the the, the great tipping point in this relationship between the evangelical community and our political culture and, and specifically this alliance that has been, you know, several generations strong between Republican uh, Party politics and between uh, white evangelical Christians. Um, you really see how what was once 
a, an alliance that just sort of made sense in certain respects, some shared priorities, um, has really almost turned into something that is built on existential stakes and and tremendous fear. And that's a dangerous that's a dangerous place to be, mm, I yeah. think, for, for for a lot of us who, regardless of where you stand politically, um, you know, believers are told again and again and again and again, you know, Genesis through Revelation, fear not, right? Like, like that fear is deeply unhealthy in, in, in anywhere in society, but it, it is especially unhealthy inside the church. And I think that that fear has in many ways provided the ammunition for some of these forces outside of the church. I love what you said in the book. You said there's two words, and I'm going to butcher it. I'm going to get them wrong, but basically under duress or under stress, like basically what what actually explains Donald Trump. And it is the fact that like how did he how did he capture the evangelical heart and mind? It's because evangelicals felt m like martyrs. They felt attacked. And under the Obama years, especially, I just remember just getting really starting, even looking into politics. Obama got elected when I was had just graduated. I remember going to one of his um, I, I remember going to one of his rallies and I was literally sitting there and I, I'm in college at the time in Pennsylvania. He was on a train tour. And he came in and I saw Obama speak and I was like, I got to do this. Like if he's the first black president, I need to be there. I need to see it. I need to, you know, be a part of it. And he's speaking and I was chanting, no, like, I was like, no more Bush, no more Bush. I'm like, all right, fine. Everyone else is doing no more Bush. So mm -hmm. it was, it, it, you know, and it was electrifying and all that stuff. Now I didn't end up voting for Obama. That's just, that's just because I'm white probably. So I didn't end up voting for Obama. It was just the way that, you know, white Republicans, you know, were. So the whole reason I'm putting all that out there is that this has been happening for a long time. And, and Trump seems like he's someone who is capitalizing on a situation, right? That there is a strong contingent of voters who feel like they're martyrs, who have a lot of money and they have a lot of power. And if you can get them activated, and American history has shown when you get evangelicals activated, at least in the second part of the 20th century, they can get things done, Right. And, and, and move things forward. And if you get them with a cosmic battle, then now it's good and evil. Then it's not, then I'll die for it, right? Then I will become a martyr for it. Like that kind of, and I've heard people talk about that. And I've heard people talking about it for a long time. It's deeply concerning to me. People tell me, hey, you know, Sandy Hook was, I had a church member tell me, you know, Sandy Hook was made up, right? They made all that up. They're just trying to take away our guns. And so, and this was years ago, before before Trump was even right. A Sandy Hook during Trump? No, that no, was during Obama. Obama. Yeah. So, so it was before Trump was even like you know there, like in terms of like really seriously a contender. So it's been around for a long time, and I've been yakking, just giving context for this question. Definitions are so important, and I feel like we walk around. And if I say Christian nationalism, I have good friends that say there's nothing wrong with that. I'm patriotic. They think Christian nationalism is I'm patriotic um, and I'm a Christian and I'm really patriotic. You know, I don't want our country to go down the toilet. Neither do I. Right. So I, I'm patriotic and God is going to bless this country and whatever. So help us understand from your personal experience. We've had academic. We've had, um, you know, scholars on here explaining what Christian nationalism from a philosophical point of view. You had a guy who wrote the case for Christian nationalism on our podcast to talk about it. So we've had all those things. But what has been what has been your experience of what Christian nationalism is on the folk level, on the level of the normal people walking through this, telling people that Sandy Hook is made up and that COVID's not real? What what is Christian nationalism in that context? 
Help us understand it and define it. Yeah, look, it's it's a really important question because definitions are important to your point, and um, and we can really we do a disservice to the dialogue we all need to be having when we throw around terms haphazardly. For me, I think about this in pretty simple terms, right? My, I view my national identity through the lens of my faith identity, right? But I think for a lot of folks that has flipped and they view their faith identity through the lens of their national identity, right? And that's dangerous. It's dangerous for for any number of reasons. Um, I think when you start to get into the, this this talk of of Christian nationalism, we're talking about something more than just um, well, we need to have a country governed by Christian laws, right? And and we need we we should declare Christianity state religion, as some people want to do, or we should. Uh, we, we should impose a religious test on immigrants coming to this country like Trump floated a couple of weeks ago on the campaign trail. Um, it gets beyond that specific thing. I think, although those are obviously, you know, components of it or symptoms of the, of the, of the sickness, I think what we're dealing with at its core is a question of idolatry, right? We, we, we are talking about People who feel as though America is in covenant with God. And and when you believe that something is blessed, consecrated in that way, that thing can become an object of obsession, of worship, of idolatry. And and you feel as though, you know, as, as the pastor who succeeded my dad at my home church, he explains this better than I ever could in chapter one of the book. But he says, look, once you get to that point, you believe that fighting for America is fighting for God and that you have to fight for America as though salvation hangs in the balance. Right. And that is a that is a complete misreading of Scripture. Um, and I think we have to just we have to say this plainly. Right. Um there's a difference between, in my view, folks who have just sort of gotten their priorities mixed up a little bit and who, uh, you know, they, they, the, the emotion of the moment has gotten to them in recent years. You know, COVID-19, George Floyd, Trump's reelection, January 6th, right? There's been a lot going on. It's a crazy time in America, right? There are some people who I think really mean well and who they've just, um, they've strayed a little bit. They've gotten those priorities mixed up. There are others, however, who I think have really just um, brazenly and and shamelessly hijacked Christianity uh, and, and, and tried to weaponize the gospel of Jesus Christ for ends that are entirely abiblical, and um, and they're simultaneously telling every other Christian that if you're not doing this, then you're a coward. You're you're weak. You're just like the uh, Germans who didn't stand up to Hitler. Right. And that is, I would say, sort of Christian nationalist in its purest form is 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 Christian nationalism is sort of seizing Christianity, the concept of Christianity, and wielding it as a weapon to advance a nationalist ideal. Um, and and again, there are varying degrees of this. It's, it's a bit of a spectrum that we can unpack. But there are certain folks who have done that in ways that are profoundly, profoundly damaging. And I think that's, that's where we, as a body of believers, uh, we are called, you know, the New Testament model is, which we in America have completely turned on its head. Um, the New Testament model is, you know, grace for the outsiders. They don't know better. They don't know God. We are to treat them with grace. Uh, but real strict accountability for the insiders. Uh, those, those, those in our tribe, those inside the church, um, we are to hold them accountable. And it feels as though the time has come 
for a bit of a reckoning in the church when it comes to this question specifically of of Christian nationalism because if if you if you you know Philippians three twenty says you know our our citizenship is in heaven um and and there's it becomes there are certain things in in scripture that are you know a bit ambiguous they can be interpreted different ways but this question of the kingdom to which we are called and how God makes it clear and Jesus makes it clear that that um that there is no competition here that they that they they will not tolerate competition so we either belong to that kingdom to which we are called or we belong to this kingdom ultimately but it can't be both there there's no dual citizenship here it's just it's not an option wow um so you're in your book you you discuss um obviously the the significant support of Donald Trump from a lot of evangelical voters and and it's it's something that is bewildering to me um even to this day and and we we were <laughs> we were blessed to be able to speak with uh uh, Stephen Hassan, who wrote a book called The Cult of Trump, which uh, is really, really good and answered a lot of questions uh, I think I had about about people in the faith. But I'm, you know, I'm curious to kind of get your, you know, thoughts, you know, top three reasons why evangelicals have flocked to 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 Trump, because I'll 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 be honest, like sometimes I have to I have to do kind of like a, a self check because I'm as as a Christian myself, I'm like, there are more Christians in this country that support Trump than the not. Uh, and, you know, am I, am I making the right decision? Not necessarily <laughs> like idolizing or supporting Trump. I mean, I, I, I consider myself somewhat of a baby Christian. I came to the faith back in 2008. Um, so I don't profess that I have all the answers and, you know, and, and if there's some scripture that says, yeah, you know, if you're not, if not, if you're not worshiping at the altar of the golden Trump, then you're going to hell. You know, so so what are what are what are some of the arguments that you're hearing for for why evangelicals have have flocked to Trump? Well, look, I, I think if you go back to 2016, there were real deep seated doubts among not just the evangelical rank and file, but uh, among some of the most prominent evangelical leaders in this country, many of whom have since become you know, Trump acolytes, but, you know, they p privately and even publicly in certain instances were really just explicit in saying that they didn't trust this guy, that they, you know, he'd spent his entire life as a, you know, a, a skirt chasing Manhattan billionaire, pro-choice, Planned Parenthood supporting Democrat donating liberal, right? So like, what, you know, why would they trust him? Um, What's interesting, though, is that, and, and we kind of flicked at this earlier in the conversation, but Trump has excellent political instincts. I think that that is consistently misunderstood about him, that he really does get this in ways that a lot of people don't understand. And to the point that you guys made earlier about, you know, what a huge voting block white evangelicals are and how what, you know, history tells us as far as when that voting block really gets engaged and mobilized, things happen because of it. So Trump recognized that. So what does he do? He starts talking about specific things. He makes a promise to uh, to. So you asked for three, and this will this will actually I think give a good window into that. So first he uh, promises pro life Supreme Court justices. Right. He he issues a list and he gives names, which is something that had never been done before. And he said, "Look, you can hold me to it. This is the list. I'm going to pick." one of these pro-choice Supreme Court justices, right? And then, of course, he winds up choosing three later on, and Roe v. Wade comes down because of it, and we can get into that. Number two, he starts talking about the Johnson Amendment. Now, it, for those of us, for, for those of you listening who grew up outside of the evangelical bubble, this idea of the Johnson Amendment might sound completely foreign. The idea, basically, is that, you know, for many generations, uh, there's been a fear in the evangelical community that this amendment signed into law under uh, L Lyndon Baines Johnson in his presidency would allow the government to come after churches that engage in political speech from the pulpit, right? And even though we have a huge body of evidence to show that the government 
has never done anything of that sort and really doesn't even have any interest in doing... I mean, there are churches that have basically made it their mission to dare the government to come after them (laughs) by engaging in the most explicit political activity possible, and the IRS still hasn't lifted a finger just because it's not something they're going to do. So... But 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 so the abortion issue, the big government is coming after us issue. And then I think the third thing, he chose Mike Pence, right? And that was, I think, symbolically really interesting because one of the things that really freaked out evangelical Christians about Trump was his personal history, right? You know, it, it was very difficult for a lot of these people to try to square, well, hold on a second, I... I told my kids that morality matters in public life, that that character is essential in our public leaders. And, you know, my dad, my parents threw a viewing party for George W. Bush's inauguration, not because they loved Bush, but because they were so disgusted by Bill Clinton and his, you know, Mm. scandals in office. Right. So it was a lot of it was difficult for evangelicals to reconcile that position with then voting for Trump. So when Trump uh, brings onto the ticket the guy who, you know, drinks milk with dinner every night and who won't go out to any sort of a uh, an outing without his wife present and who is like a model of Christian virtue. And he is. I mean, listen, I can disagree with Pence and criticize him on a number of fronts, but he is a very decent man who's mm-hmm. committed to his family and who lives out his values, right? Yep. And I think that was Trump signaling to a lot of these people, look, if you vote for me, I'm not going to backslide into the sort of depraved, you know, Playboy channel cameo Donald Trump that you used to know, right? Um, And I think that was sufficient in the 2016 election to give these folks a reason to suspend their skepticisms and say, you know what, I'm still a little bit uneasy about this, but the alternative is Hillary Clinton. The alternative is, you know, one or two or three pro-choice Supreme Court justices. And and I'm willing to take this chance on this guy. I think that that was a completely defensible position for a lot of evangelicals to take. And I, I say in the book that, you know, um, I know lots of people. That who was me. Took that vote. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's in 2016. It was in 2016. I think the I think the argument becomes altogether different and much less convincing by the time you get to 2020. And then now looking ahead to 2024, boy, oh boy. I mean, yeah. you, this guy is out on the stump saying things, you know, calling his opponent vermin and, you know, well, really calling a- anybody who disagrees with him vermin and saying that they should be run out of the country and talking about not letting any non-Christian migrants in. Like it, it becomes very difficult to rationalize at this stage. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Sorry, I, I blanked there for a second. Let me mark that. Um, <laughs> let me mark that well so you can. Right. I went. Uh, so I we went on. I went on such a tangent there. Yeah. No, dude, it was so good. Well, what happened was like, like you hit you. You made me think of something, and so I went and I looked at it. I'm like, oh, maybe I can look this up real quick, and then you were done. I'm like, oh. Crap. I, and Will said, hey, it's you. And so I was like, oh, no. So let's go to COVID-19 for a second. OK, so when COVID-19 came out. All of us, right, we're just in this like almost like this. Um, that we We're in like a different world kind of thing. Like, what is this place? Like why, you know, in India, like you could see the sky again because no one was driving. And so there was no you know, pollution. And so they literally could see the clouds again for like, you know, for a few days because of the lack of pollution and all this stuff. And, it, and so that's the maybe a nice part, but then we're all freaked out. We don't know what's going on, but it never once occurred to me that it wasn't a real thing and that it wasn't a real virus, that it wasn't a real disease manufactured or not. I have no problem with saying that, you know, we could manufacture something and write, uh, you know, it came out in Wuhan and where they're doing laboratory tests on those exact kind of viruses. So I don't think it's super like a stretch to say that it escaped or maybe even purposefully. I don't know. Show me the evidence and we'll figure that out. But never once did I think it was it real. Never once did I think that, you know, you know, I, we had Governor Northam here, super, you know, liberal government governor here in Virginia and before Yunkin. And um, 
I thought he did a great job handling it. I thought that, I mean, personally, I thought that, you know, all the things were good, right? The reason I'm bringing it up, because in the book, you talk about how people can say it's made up. The government's trying to control us. They're just trying to get Donald Trump out, which it's like he's the guy who like did Operation Warp Speed or whatever right. it was called right. And, right. And, 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 and had this thing, took away all the red tape to get this thing going. So with the COVID-19, and, and this hits personally, because there's so many people that I saw leave good churches and go to churches that just had someone who was less careful charismatic, whatever. And you talk about this, the church that goes from a hundred floodgate or whatever that goes from a hundred to thousands mm -hmm. or whatever it was, 1500 people now attending this church. And, um, and I've seen that that is not a, that is not, um, an exception, right? That's, that has been happening over and over and over and over again in every single, uh, major city. In, in this country. And how do you feel like the response of the evangelical church and movement, what do you, how do you feel like it's response to the pandemic kind of reflected the values and the priorities that were really like, how did it expose our idols essentially? How you know, did it, 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 it's it's a great question because I think in a lot of ways, and sometimes people are surprised if I say this, but I think in a lot of ways, COVID-19 did more to expose these schisms in the church than even Trump did. Um, Absolutely. You know, because think about this. I mean, with what I had said earlier about the, the kind of generations long, low simmering panic about the government coming for us and secular uh, secular progressives are going to shut down your churches. They're not going to let you worship. They're going to persecute Christianity. It's happening overseas. It's going to come to come to America, right? In some ways, COVID-19 was like the fulfillment of that prophecy, right? If you if you've been marinating in that message for decades and suddenly the governor of your blue state says, "Hey, you're not allowed to go to worship this Sunday." Yeah, now, man. keep in mind, you know, like okay, well, it, now if if there was a if there was a um a, a gas leak in your church, right? And there was a fire truck out front on Sunday morning. And they said, hey, sorry, there's a gas leak. It's, it's dangerous to your health. You can't go in there. Would people have viewed that as a, you know, as big government trying to, you know, shut down Christianity? I doubt it. I, I guess it all depends if, if somebody believes that the gas leak was real. <laughs> right. That's yeah, <laughs> fair, fair enough. That's, that's a good point. But, you know, it's like in, in some sense, I think all of this kind of crazy rhetoric around Christianity under siege and we're being persecuted, which by the way, like it just completely, like we almost obscure the fact that like time and time and time again, you know, Jesus, Peter, Paul, they're all like, yes, persecution, bring it on. Like that's like, like you want, you want a recipe for <laughs> drawing closer to God and becoming a better Christian, be persecuted. Right. Like, but that's a, that's a separate podcast, but we're, we're, so we're all getting so fired up and, and, and kind of bent out of shape around this idea of, you know, the church being in the crosshairs of, of big government that I think it gave a lot of Christians permission, they felt, to talk and behave in ways that they never would have otherwise. Um, you know, you've got people coming after pastors in the middle of COVID, calling them Marxists because they closed their doors for like three or four Sundays. Like, what are we, what are we doing here? What are we talking about? Right. Um, or if they said, Hey, we're going to do some social distancing in the pews or, Hey, uh, we, we've got a large elderly population. Could you please wear masks? And people would go in refusing to wear them, refusing saying, no, 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 I'm not. No faith over fear. I'm not, I'm not wearing a mask. Like, I'm sorry, but y again, there's a, th like, this is, this is a psychological phenomenon that I think we've barely be began to unpack here because, and I think it's going to be something studied in the church for a long time. I think you're going to have seminary students who haven't even been born yet, who are one day going to f learn about this period of church history because 
it wasn't just the, the, the reshuffling from one congregation to the next that you described, Pastor, although obviously there was a ton of that, and I've documented a lot of it myself. Um, it was also the behavioral changes that people suddenly mm. felt free uh, to, to uh, again, it kind of goes back to this, the, the question around like wielding Christianity as a, as a weapon um, and, and viewing the church as like a battlefield to be conquered instead of a, a bride to be loved. That, that's what it felt like is that churches suddenly were, were, were becoming battlefields uh, and the, the, the fighting was no longer over doctrine, over theology. I mean, those were like the good old days, right? And now it's, you know, are you a Marxist? Uh, uh, are, are, you a, are you a woke progressive? Are you practicing critical race theory if you, if you uh, preach about racial reconciliation? You know, but, but all of that, I think in a way, really does trace back to those first few weeks of the COVID outbreak and the decisions that some pastors made uh, especially pastors in blue states where you had Democratic governors uh, imposing uh, restrictions, that those wounds have not healed in these churches. And in fact, um, I've been talking with some of these pastors just in the last couple of weeks who I keep up with. And I think the fear obviously is, you know, with Trump on the ballot again, with a, a Biden-Trump rematch looking very likely in 2024, um, whatever peace and harmony has been visible at surface level, maybe over the last couple of years, as people have tried to bind up these wounds, um, it could, th this thing could really fall right back apart and, and, and turn even uglier in some ways than it, than it had been. It yeah. happened to the good old days of being able to excommunicate someone just for sexual sin. Now we have to, I mean, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have to, we have to make, we have to make church great again, Josh. That's, that's, that's make your job. <laughs> Dude, that is the new platform. Make <laughs> MCCA. No, MCGA. Yeah. MCGA. Doesn't have the same. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't really roll off the tongue very, very oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, so so Tim, I, I'm I'm curious. Um you've spoken to a ton of people just kind of about you know, various faith related matters and and it's really easy to kind of just focus on all the like it's easy to focus on the downfall of American Christianity. Um, because there's just so much material, but like, like, can you, can you give us a story an experience an interview or just, you know, some interaction you've had with, with, um, people that you've gone, gone about the country, you know, that, that can kind of, I don't know, reinstill some hope into, into, you know, uh, me as a Christian. Um, and cause I mean, I'm sure you, you've heard it. Tons of people leaving the church, right? Um, for a variety of different reasons. Probably the, the most common reason I hear from people is like, yeah, Christians are just crazy. Um, so so help help me, you know, regain some confidence or hope um, in American evangelicals. You know, I would say a couple of things. The first being that what breaks my heart and a big part of the reason that I wanted to write this book is that uh, I think the, the non-believing world has judged the church, understandably so, based on its worst attributes, based on its, you know, uh, ugliest behaviors and, and its, uh, you know, and that's, that's hard. I, I think it's hard when, when you think about kind of sweeping characterizations of any movement, any institution, but it's especially hard when it comes to the church because as John Dixon, the Australian theologian who teaches at Wheaton College, he, he writes in one of his books about how Christ wrote this perfect symphony, like the most beautiful symphony the world has ever heard, every note flawless, just, just, just perfect. And, and you can't even, you don't even know how to process it. It's so beautiful. And then a bunch of us Joes on the street, pick up our tubas and our, you know, trombones and our, and we try to play it and it sounds terrible. And people listening say, well, that, that symphony is terrible. Mm. You know, that symphony stinks. And you're like, well, no, 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 hold on. It's just that I'm not any good at playing it. Right. Mm. Don't judge the, don't judge the symphony, judge me. And I think, um, 
making that distinction between those of us who are not always musically gifted versus uh, the conductor and versus the symphony is really important. And so what I've tried to do with the book and, and what I see a lot of people in my generation doing, and this will be my second point in a moment, but trying to make that distinction and trying to present to the outside world, like, look, ultimately this book is trying to shine a light into the darkness, right? And when you shine a light into darkness, it exposes what is wrong and what is false. And that can be very unpleasant. But it also illuminates what is right and what is true. You know, C.S. Lewis said that we know what a crooked line looks like only because we know what a straight line looks like. And I think exposing on the one hand, but also illuminating is just really important. And that's the work that, that I see a lot of Christians recommitting themselves to because whatever's gone wrong in the church, they recognize that ultimately the best thing for the church is the same thing that's the best thing for the broader culture, which is Jesus, right? And so how do we turn the emphasis back to Jesus? How, how, do, we, how, how do we focus on the symphony and not on the people trying to play it? And I would, so I would add to that, the great source of hope for me in this project has been young people. Um, because I'll tell you, these, I refer to them at one point in the book as the children of the moral majority. And I would kind of consider myself in that, in that camp, you know, my parents, that was Absolutely. their generation. And, 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 Absolutely. And, and the children of the moral majority, we process this stuff a lot, just in a very different way. Um, for example, I think where so many of the threats were externalized to the moral majority, right? The government is coming for us. And they're going to shut down our churches. It's the secularists. It's, you know, it's all from the outside, this threat. I think many younger Christians, when they think about the, 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 the threat posed to Christianity, they start inside the church. It is an internalized conversation. It is, how did we get this so wrong? How do we clean it up? How can we better witness to our neighbors, right? And one of the places I saw that most readily was at Liberty University, where in some ways, liberty has become like a poster child of, of the corruption of the evangelical movement, right? And yet, within yeah. that, you've got tens of thousands of young people on that campus, uh, young, conservative, evangelical Christians who they want nothing to do with the, with the Trump movement. They want nothing to do with the yeah. MAGA movement. They, they don't find their identity in American politics. And that is a significant generational break from where their parents have been. And the, uh, and the thing that I really notice about them, these young people, when they talk to their parents about it, they're not judgmental. They're not mean-spirited. They're not condescending. They're loving. They, they're, they're trying to bring back these folks who have maybe lost the plot a little bit, who have maybe gotten their priorities a little bit mixed up. I think this next generation of evangelicals, they have their eyes wide open and they can see this for what it is. And, and that gives me tremendous hope. That's so good. I really appreciate you sharing that, Tim. So we're a podcast that's called Faithful Politics. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very good at observations and stating the obvious. And so when we have faithful politics, um, the work we're trying to do in connecting people with people who think differently, to be able to talk about it, to be able to work through some of these issues, to not, sh you know, um, stray away from difficult questions. What would you say or even recommend to even a podcast like us? on how, like, how to implement the spirit, maybe the methods, but even more importantly, the spirit behind what, what you're trying to get out in this book. How can we be a part of that light that, you know, the hope and that light that continues, even though maybe sometimes it looks small or whatever, like there are people, there's always a remnant, right? Yeah. Like, uh, like God told uh, Elijah when he was uh, 
not happy about his life and 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 wishing for death he said there's a uh, there's a remnant so what do you what, what do you say to the remnant what are they supposed to do you know look i would i would just say this um a friend of mine, Curtis Chang, I don't know if you guys know Curtis, but, uh, you know, he's affiliated with the Duke Divinity program. He was a, a pastor himself. Um, he now uh, works as a consultant, but very involved in evangelical spaces. And he has helped to launch this project called The After Party, which is really aimed at rethinking uh, how Christians engage with politics. And one of the things that Curtis has said from the jump that really strikes me is that, listen, when we read scripture as believers, there is some uh, wiggle room on questions of who, who we vote for, what, what policies we support, right? But there's no wiggle room at all on the, on the question of how, how are we to conduct ourselves, Right. And so if you just use the how as a benchmark, you know, if, if you read the Gospels and, and you listen to the ways that Jesus instructs his disciples and his followers to interface with people that disagree with them, with people who treat them terribly, with people who outright persecute them and want them dead, the how in that is so straightforward. There's no ambiguity. It's, it's, it's love, it's grace, it's forgiveness. Um, and I feel like the, the great irony in this whole conversation around the sort of uh, unraveling of the evangelical movement and, and this sort of um, idolatry complex taking hold that so, and this barbarians at the gate mentality that gives a permission structure for us to treat people terribly and, and abandon all Christ likeness that, that we have learned. Um, the answer to all of that is right there in scripture. Like we don't have to, we don't have to look far and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like read the gospel of John. I, I like if you, if you get in your car for an hour long ride and you pull out your Bible app and just listen to the gospel of John, like it is so striking how, clear that message is. Um, and it feels like if we get back to a place where guys like yourselves who disagree on some of these political issues, but who agree entirely on the how, and you treat one another in a certain way because it is how you are commanded to treat one another, boy, that would be a big step in the right direction. Wow, that's that, that's so cool. I, I, there's this, um, <clears throat> this Christian organization, or this Christian guy who runs this like homeless community in Texas somewhere. And, and, uh, he, he was interviewed by, by somebody a couple years ago. And, and, uh, you know, he said, yeah, even though we're, we're a Christian base, we don't allow proselytizing, um, at all kind of within sort of the center. He's like, but I do think that, um, we should evangelize and we should preach the gospel on a daily basis, but only in unique circumstances should we use words. Um, mm. and, and I think that like what you've done with the writing of this book and just sort of, you know, I don't know if you want to call it a ministry, but just out there talking to people, I think really, really captures the essence of what he, what he said, because I think that you, you're doing more for the Christian faith, uh, by, one, exposing uh, maybe just like bad behavior, and then two, just showing that uh, God can love <laughs> in ways that may not necessarily be representative of what we see on TV or we hear on, you know, certain uh, news channels or whatnot. Um, so I, I just want to really just thank you for for all the, uh, you know, all the work that you put into this book. I'm sure it was really difficult. Um, and um, yeah, and I just... You know, I, I guess I guess moving moving forward, like how, how how can people get a hold of your your book? Yeah, you know, uh, I appreciate you saying that, Will. I do, I really do. And um, you know, I'm uh, to be clear, I'm uh, I'm the worst of all the sinners, and, and there's nothing <laughs> special about me. There's something really special about about Jesus, though. And uh, to the extent that I can try and um, uh, be like him and, and share that with people. That's, that's my mission. That's my ministry. Um, you can find the book. That's so good. 
Yeah, you can find the book wherever, man. You can find it on Amazon or, or HarperCollins or at you know local bookstores near you. And um, and uh, I have a website by timalberta dot com. People can read my emails on there. I, I'm happy to you know people want to shout at me or pray for me or both. <laughs> uh, that's that's cool. I, I like to I like to hear from folks. So uh, I'm an easy guy to find, and I'd be really blessed if. Uh, if folks would consider picking up a copy or, or sharing it with somebody that they love. Cause I think that we're at a, we're at a pretty interesting crossroads here. And I just hope that um, yeah, we, are. we can at least have a dialogue about, about why and where we go from here. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, Tim Alberta. Um, the book is the kingdom, the power and the glory American evangelicals in the a and an age of extremism. And um, yeah, make sure you go out and buy the book. So thanks again, Tim for everything. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks. Bless you. All right. Appreciate you having me.